Dieter dealt with the issue of, of trusting the Bible. It dealt with the issue of, of doubt. And uh, I, ju I just want to come at it from, uh, from another angle, and that angle is that of, uh, of, of archaeology. <clears throat> I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of people's great dream, isn't it, to, to discover some ancient artifact, um, you know, some item from a bygone age, and especially if it happens, to, you know, it turns out to be priceless. You know, you make the, uh, the news headlines by, by uh, finding something of, of that order. <clears throat> I don't know how many people here remember the time team, mm. but, um, uh, they, you know, they... That's a group of people who were made up of, um, of consummate uh, enthusiasts, and, and, and their favour, their fervour rather, was infectious. So that, not least because what they were doing was in this country, and so that encouraged people to go out uh, with their metal detectors and such like, uh, finding things themselves uh, up and down down the country. <clears throat> What always struck me about, I mean, I didn't see many of those programs, but I'm always fascinated by uh, th this kind of thing here. Uh, but if, I wonder if you ever noticed, if you did watch any of this stuff, did you ever notice that they, if, if they were in a particular area, they cut trenches through the, the, the land that they were hoping to survey? And that, that alerts you to something really quite important. Archaeology is often a sampling process. Yeah? So, so the trenches are there just in, in the hope that they cut across something and, and, and from all those trenches be able to build up a picture of what is there uh, underground and then you start the digging process. So it is a sampling process and uh, so, so uh, if you, there's, there's a warning here in a kind of way, isn't there? And that is that uh, we mustn't expect more from archaeology than it can give us. Huh? Now, biblical archaeology... <clears throat> Um, doesn't set out, I'd like to suggest to you, doesn't set out to prove or disprove the Bible. Not for a second. Its aim, very simply, is to throw light on a past age. It's to throw light um, on, on some Bible text, if you wish. It's to throw light on, on the lives, real lives, that were being lived hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. And, and so it's not, it's not there at all to, to take that very, very um, strong point of view of proving or disproving the Bible. I hope I can make that clear uh, as, as we go through uh, the rest of this little session here. Tying two things together here, we were talking about, Adit was talking then about the, the document and, and such like. Um, uh, you know, with regard to the reliability of... Um, uh, of the of the Bible as as a document, <clears throat> uh, the story is well known. <clears throat> some some boys who were doing what dare I say it? Am I allowed to say this these days? Doing things that most boys tend to do, and that is to throw stones. And one one lad just lobbed a stone into a cave, and it made a sound that they weren't quite expecting. So there were others with him. They went into the caves, and discovered that the stone had broken a clay jar. And in the clay jar, there was a scroll. Oh my word! There's another clay jar. Oh, and there's one there. And in fact, although not shown on that photo there, there's a series. If you go, as it were, towards that that top left top right hand corner of the the photo, there's a series of caves. All of which, most of, most of which, contained clay jars, known to us now as the Dead Sea Scrolls. The rest, as they say, is, um, is history. Now, th those scrolls were put in those jars in AD 68, okay? And um, they contain copies of every single Old Testament book, with one exception, and the exception is Esther. We can speculate why that should be the case. It doesn't matter. All I'm saying here is that every Old Testament book, except one, uh, copies of which uh, were found in those, uh, in those clay jars. And, and one of them, <clears throat> this, um, uh, this, this is the, the complete scroll of the book of Isaiah. And uh, this completed scroll... Uh, uh, I'm being less than honest here. This is a facsimile of the real thing, but it's in there for you and me. It's the real thing for, for the moment. Um, th this complete scroll of Isaiah is dated round about 100 B.C. Okay. Did you know that the oldest 
Isaiah scroll of any kind, or any part of Isaiah that we've got is actually uh, AD 9916. Well, put it in round figures. This is a thousand years older than the oldest Isaiah manuscript that was available until this one was found. Okay? The astonishing thing is this, that when they compared the, the one of the, the 10th century copy of Isaiah, and this one here, 95% met match between those two. The other 5%, if I get my facts right here, the other 5% relates to individual letters or simply the style of writing. Okay? So 95% of the, 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 the Isaiah scroll that we've got for, or at least the book of Isaiah, in AD 916, Almost exactly the same as the one that was a thousand years older. Now just let that sink in a little bit here. Because what that really means is this. That the te and, and by the way, and this too is no different. I haven't got my own personal Bible in front of me here. But if you have a look at the book of Isaiah in your Bible, whatever version you happen to choose... All right, you'll find that they're virtually identical. So in other words, the, the, the book of Isaiah has remained unchanged for 2,000 years. What am I trying to say here? I think what I'm trying to say simply is this, that uh, it just will not do to suggest that over a period of time, this drops out, somebody puts something extra in, and da da da, da and such like, and that by the time you get to uh, just a couple of generations or so down the line, that's a very different book to the one that they started with. 2,000 years, no change, virtually. Worth just mentioning, I think. Yeah. What I'm, I think I'm trying to suggest here, this gives us confidence uh, that the Bible that we have contains what was originally written. I know it's one item, but I'll, I'll leave that one with you. Still, we're talking about the witness of, of, <clears throat> of archaeology. If you look in the, the early books of the Old Testament, there are lots of names of nations and tribes that are brought to your attention. One tribe that is never missing out of all the, the, the lists which are there in the very earliest books of the Bible um, is the name the Hittites, a group known as the Hittites. Well, they've never been heard of anywhere else. There is just no reference whatsoever to the Hittites anywhere else except in the Bible. So you can understand that there were uh, real doubts as to the accuracy of the biblical record. <clears throat> that is the gateway to the capital of the Hittites. It's one example where the Bible brings to our attention a particular item and a long time afterwards the trowel and the spade unearth it. So the Bible was right in that respect there. The other one that comes to mind is this one. One of the outstanding empires um, in the history of the Middle East uh, was that of Assyria. Right. And there's an awful lot now available um, in, in various places about, the, uh, about that empire of the, the Assyrians. <coughs> in our Bible... <coughs> We've got these words here. In the year that the supreme commander sent by Sargon, king of Assyria, came to Ashdod and attacked and captured it. I mean, as that stands by itself, it doesn't make sense. Just, just, just get hold of what's there for us, right? Uh, sent uh, a supreme commander who had been sent by uh, King Sargon, the king of Assyria, came to Ashdod, attacked it and captured it. <coughs> Sargon one of the Assyrian kings here. <clears throat> well, there was deep scepticism over the Bible being accurate about that. Uh, apparently, there, there is an obelisk with all the names of the Assyrian kings, except this one. And so, quite plainly, understandably, in fact, you'd have to say, the, the view was that uh, it, it's clearly got its... Um, whatever other name should have been there in, in Isaiah chapter 20, it certainly shouldn't have been Sargon. He just doesn't exist at all. His name is not on the list. So the Bible was clearly in error. <clears throat> and then they found his palace. Every brook... Brook? It could be a brick, I guess. Every brick 
in the palace when they'd unearthed it had got his name on it, Sargon, 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 okay? But only, well, and uh, just a few more bits and pieces here. Um, you can see from the, the size of the, or some of the, the monuments there, see the workers next to you, get some sense of the size of these things. And the, the bottom line here, the, the bottom photo here, is taken in the British Museum. If you want to find out more, just go to the British Museum. It's all in there. Loads of Assyrian stuff. But anyway, back, back with the Sargon and Ashdod. His capture of Ashdod, which was, I hope you remember, in the passage I showed you earlier from Isaiah, um, the capture of Ashdod was engraved on those pillars, uh, on the palace walls. Not only that, but when the archaeologists went to Ashdod and started digging around, they came across fragments of a monument. Uh, and that monument recorded Sargon's victory in Ashdod. One of the inscriptions reads, Sargon, king of Assyria, who conquered Samaria and the entire region of Israel, he who had made captives of Ashdod. No one doubts Sargon was a real person. And as I say, there are lots of things relating to Sargon particularly, which you will find in the British Museum. <clears throat> now, Sargon had, had a son who was perhaps better known than Sargon himself, and his name was Sennacherib. A uh, powerful king with a powerful army. He, he overran uh, and conquered very large areas of Israel. It was still in the Middle East, all right? Uh, and in fact, he was responsible for removing a lot of people from what was then known as Israel back to his land uh, as captives, and they were taken into exile. He also captured virtually everything that was to do with Judea. That was the lower region of that section that today we would call Israel. <clears throat> And it included a place called Lachish. Now, the archaeologists have done extensive work at Lachish, and they have found for themselves the evidence of the ferocity of the Assyrian army. They were renowned for being brutes, and the evidence has been found. But rather more to the point, someone discovered they found uh, someone discovered the, the crest of an Assyrian helmet. So they were definitely there, and the rest, as I say, is, um, is history. All of this is in the second book of Kings, it's chapters 18 and 19. We won't be looking at the detail right now, but I just mentioned that in passing. However, he famously besieged Jerusalem. There wasn't a lot left of the land, by the way, of settlements. Everything had just been virtually uh, overrun by Sennacherib, um, walled cities, Small settlements, farmsteads, everything taken by the Assyrian army. <clears throat> and um, this, I'm, I'm about to say, this is known as the, the Taylor Prison. Why I want to tell you that, I have no idea, except that it relates to the man who was responsible for, A, not only finding it, but also being involved, I think, in the, in the deciphering of what the message is. But anyway, this is the, the important thing is this. This is what Sennacherib, this is Sennacherib's record, all right, of his attack on Jerusalem. As for Hezekiah, king of Israel, king of Judah, I should say, real man. As for Hezekiah, the Judean, who did not submit to my yoke, I surrounded, I conquered 46 of his strong walled towns and innumerable small settlements. He himself, I shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city, like a caged bird. What Sennacherib does not put on there, however, is that he failed to take Jerusalem. What Sennacherib does not tell you on there is that his army was sent off in flight. What he does not tell you there, well, he couldn't because it would be too late then. I was about to say that his two sons killed him. You'll appreciate it. He couldn't have told you that bit. But the interesting thing is, in Assyrian documents, the death of Sennacherib at the hands of his two sons, they've made notice of. All I've been saying to you is in the Bible. It's there already in the Bible. But Sennacherib, uh, well, come on, I mean, who, 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 who would you accept? I mean, of these kind of characters, whether they are Sennacheribs or whether they're pharaohs, they're not going to mention as a, as, a, a, you know, as a permanent record their defeats, are they? They, they just wouldn't 
make that broadcast, where they wouldn't make that public, would they? But at any rate, so the Necrib only tells you half the story. My point simply is that the Bible says that, he, unfortunately, he came to a sticky end at the hands of his two sons, but the Assyrian records also record that's exactly how it took place. So, you know, no connection otherwise, is there, between the Bible and the Assyrian records, and yet in this they have agreed. I should just say, by the way, <clears throat> Uh, before the siege began, that King Hezekiah was a, uh, could, could see there's a major problem here. Our major, he, he would say to those uh, uh, around him, he said, do, do you realise our, our main source of water is actually outside the city wall? Now, the last thing we want is for those Assyrians to have control of our water supply. And he made it his business to uh, redirect the water inside the city. And... Um, this is the tunnel that he got made. I've walked through this twice. And uh, this is the tunnel that, uh, uh, that uh, I, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands were involved in this, but they hacked their way through solid rock, sometimes finding faults that make things slightly easier. But they redirected the water from outside the city wall inside to the city. And so, of course, Hezekiah was securing, if you wish, the, the water supply of the city. That's in the Bible. And you can walk through, you can actually walk through what he uh, brought to pass with the help of those people who were uh, going through that back-breaking work of producing the tunnel. I'm just going to step back in time, just for a moment or two. King Solomon. Well, he's not only for his wisdom, but his astonishing wealth. When he died... Unfortunately, uh, his kingdom was split in two and a new and a powerful king from Egypt marched north. His name was Shishak. And uh, here's an early photograph of him, by the way. Um, in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, he was, Rehoboam is one of the two characters who took over the split kingdom. Attacked Jerusalem, he carried off the treasures of the temple, the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made. He was renowned for his wealth. Fine. Now, Shishak took all this gold, <coughs> went back home, and he began to build a vast series of temple buildings <coughs> to honour the gods that he felt had given him the victory over Jerusalem and elsewhere. But rather more to the point, he had carved on the buildings all the places that he had uh, he'd been through, he had conquered, he had destroyed. <coughs> Every single name you will find is in the Bible. <coughs> it's all there in what we call the Old Testament. Well, how unfortunately, he didn't get very far. He died. So his son took over the building of these, um, these temples. And, um, and, and he gave absolutely vast quantities of gold to his gods. Um, the records, Pharaoh records for over a period of time, there is no record anywhere else in Egypt which speaks of so much gold being used by the son of Shishak. I simply ask the question, where on earth did that gold come from? And then, one more from the Old Testament here. This is Shalmaneser's obelisk. I just draw the attention here. Um, I don't know if you can see this or not. Here. This, this, this area here, right? This is just an enlarged section here. That person there was a king of Israel. Jehu by name. Now, this little episode is not in the Bible, but uh, the record here says that this Jehu bowed down to Shalmaneser and brought tribute to him. That means, well, anything he lay hands on, silver, gold, bits and pieces, uh, that he was able to bring to King uh, Shalmaneser. <clears throat> well, now, that, that same Jehu... Uh, was one of a couple of kings who had persistent trouble with a lesser-known king, a Syrian king called Hatziel. I just, you don't, I don't expect to remember the names here. What I do want you to remember is this: Hatziel was regarded locally as a very strong king, but <clears throat> he was only a king's servant, and he killed his master 
so that he could become king. Now, just, just remember that, okay? Shalmaneser later on came in contact with um, uh, Hatziel. And this is what he had to say about King Hatziel. He describes him as a nobody. And he said he was a man who became a king by treacherous means. Okay? So you got the Bible saying, uh, giving us the picture of exactly who Hatziel was and completely unconnected records by the Assyrians simply uh, confirm that that was the case. There's a much shorter period of time, of course, as far as the New Testament is concerned. I'll give you three little items here. I don't know if you can make out these here. There is the name Tiberius. I'll say what this is in a minute. And this is the name here of Pilate, Pontius Pilate. Nearly to, um, I think, the second century, say 150 or so years after Pilate died, they were rebuilding uh, a, a structure in Caesarea on the coast. And someone found this piece of lump of, uh, of stone here and used it in building a major stairway to, I'm not sure to where, I can't remember the details now. But the thing is, that, whoops, oh, hello, hello, hello. Come on, don't be shy. There we are. Um, the, the thing is that that is the only piece of masonry we've got with his name on and which would have been carved whilst he was alive. Okay, what I'm trying to say here is this is the only known inscription from his own lifetime. Oh, there are plenty of references to Pontius Pilate in documents. Josephus, for example, uh, writes quite a bit about him. But it's the only contemporary evidence for the existence of the man. The archaeologist has uncovered that for us. <clears throat> this is a slab which uh, was found in Thessalonica. That's in northern Greece and, uh, and still goes by that name today. <clears throat> now... Thessalonica, 2,000 years ago, was described as a free city. The Romans never put a governor in the town. It was free, it ran its own business, it administered everything to do with the affairs of the city. They were known as city officials. Or, they were known as polytarchs. And the word polytarch is there, uh, ringed for you. <clears throat> now this inscription plus others, including one from AD 44, confirms this to be true. The fact that the word polytarch is used there uh, demonstrates the point that Thessalonica was rather a smart place to be in. They ran their own affairs. But uh, more to the point, um, it does rather support the accuracy of Luke, who wrote the Acts. He said this, they dragged, the context doesn't matter, just look at the word. They dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials. The crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. This term city official or po uh, polytarch is a technical term. And Luke knows it. And he uses it. That's first-hand knowledge. He's very accurate in the language he uses. I'll just give you one more relating to... Uh, <clears throat> Now, in, in the blue square there is, is someone's name, and, and, and the name is Gallio. This is Luke, again, writing. While Gallio was proconsul in Achaia, clearly Gallio is a real person. Nothing mythical here whatsoever. Now, Luke calls him a proconsul. I understand um, that... Uh, States within the Roman Empire were either first rank or second rank. If you're first rank, you had a consul. If you're second rank, you had a proconsul. Achaia was a second rank state. And Luke knew that. And he uses exactly the right word in relation to, uh, to, to Gallio there. 
He's, he, and I think the point I'm trying to make here is this. So in other words, the, the, there, is the, the, there is the name in, in this uh, inscription here, but here is Luke doing his bit in giving you the background uh, to, to Gallio, getting his facts absolutely right. I think the point I want to make is this, that uh, if he's so careful over something like this, does it really matter? Does it actually matter whether he's a proconsul or a consul? To Luke, yes, apparently it does. Yeah? If he's that careful over something of this nature, um, don't you think he'll be just as careful over the really important things in his writing? This is a brief, meant to be a brief review, to show how reasonable it is uh, to see the Bible as being entirely reliable and trustworthy. Okay. It's worth noting that um, where other sources of information are available to us, whether they are written or whether they're being dug out the ground, not once has the archaeologist ever turned something up that contradicts the Bible. And that, I think, is astonishing and is worth bearing in mind. Yeah? The Bible deals with places that are real. It, deal, it deals with people who are real. These aren't myths of any kind whatsoever, and, and they are set in history. But as I said right at the beginning, just to round it off here, it's pointless to speak of archaeology either proving or disproving the Bible. It, for the simple reason, the message of the Bible is about God. Yeah? And about his dealings with Israel, his dealings with early Christians uh, through the, uh, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In ordinary men and women um, with all their fears and, and with all their failings. The Bible is about a God who has a very clear and definite purpose with this earth. And, uh, and, and we come face to face with a God who has been very active in the past. We come face to face with, uh, with, with a God who's very active at the present, if we have the eyes to see it. And we come face to face with a God who will be very active in the future, if we have the faith to believe it. Mm -hmm.